Hello and good afternoon, TVI viewers. Welcome to Cross Shorts with Neetan Shan. As you know, Cross Shorts is a weekly talk show dedicated to discussing a variety of topics that are relevant to the social, economic, political, and cultural advancement of Tamil Canadians. We just wrapped up Mental Health Awareness Week. Mental health is a topic that is often difficult one to converse about in many communities, in fact, all communities, including our own Tamil community. Mental health needs amongst youth is one of the most pressing needs in our community. So on today's episode of Cross Shorts, we mark Mental Health Awareness Week with a discussion on mental health needs among young adults. Let me begin by introducing our very experienced panelists to you. First, uh, Sudarshi Ignatius. And Sudarshi is no stranger. She used to host Cross Shorts before. And welcome back. She does uh, work as a case manager uh, dealing with uh, mental health and addiction needs. Uh, welcome to the show. And uh, Dr. B uh, Jonathan Bertram. Uh, uh, Dr. Jonathan Bertram is a uh, physician who is working with uh, many um, patients who have addiction and mental health needs. Uh, thank you very much for joining. Uh, thank Dr. you. Bertram. Thank you for having me. And uh, Jawad Bhatti. Jawad is a social worker who is working with a lot of uh, clients who have an intersection between uh, uh, their experience with the justice system, criminal justice system, and mental health. Uh, so thank you very much. You, you know, your experience and the kind of uh, knowledge that we bring to this particular topic is, is critical. So let's start by starting off. You know, uh, mental health itself is a difficult topic for many, many families to many communities. Uh, as I said, in fact, all communities, you know, everyone is struggling with having a conversation about mental health. But young people, and you know, there's a tendency to marginalize young people further because people, sometimes the older generation, sometimes assume what's the stress in their lives. Right, so it, it's even more compounded for young people too. So let's start with what are some of the you know from your experience as a practitioner, mm -hmm. what are some of the things that you're seeing in terms of needs within the youth and young adults? Yeah, so in young adults, I mean, I work with a lot of uh, I don't work with unfortunately the Tamil population. Um, I see quite a bit as uh, accessibility to substances mm -hmm. um, because that can trigger uh, mental health, the symptoms of mental health uh, problems. Um, and because they start using it at very early young age, and that's the time their their brain development happens. Mm -hmm. So um, it doesn't quite go well. Mm -hmm. um, so, so substance use is it's one of the biggest issues that I see, mm -hmm. um, and also. Um, growing up in dysfunctional families. Mm -hmm. So kids are growing up without a, a secure attachment. Um, um, so where they're uh, neglect, whether it could be a poverty or mm -hmm. parents parents have mental health problems so mm -hmm. they're unable to care for the kids. Um, neglect, it's mm -hmm. the other one, abandonment. Mm -hmm. um, so that, so kids growing up without this secure attachment, they, they become, um, they develop anxiety. Mm -hmm. um, they develop depression or um, uh, low self-esteem, mm -hmm. um, lack of empathy. Um, they, 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 you know, they, I see them not, uh, not having confidence to explore things. Um, so that's what I see, maybe that it's sort of unique to the population that I work, at, work mm -hmm. with, that, that, that the, the bringing up the family environment, mm -hmm. environment as well as the environmental factors mm -hmm. such as accessibility yeah. to drugs. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, that's, I mean, it's, it's relevant to the Tamil community as well because I had a meeting with Cantide uh, a few weeks ago and they were saying, you know, when I used to be in Cantide, many, many years ago, you know, youth violence and the visibility of the issues was there and that took the prominence. Now, those issues, the visibility is not there, but the mental health, self-esteem, you know, addiction and other things that are sometimes not visible outside are some of the major challenges. So it's not, it's not something that mm -hmm. our community is immune to or an exception to, it's, it's, it's there everywhere. Um, what about you? What, your, what is your experience in terms of seeing uh, issues among young people? Uh, you know, issues amongst young people are, uh, unfortunately, um, you know, really being highlighted across the province, mm -hmm. and uh, there's definitely more and more of a focus on that mm -hmm. uh, because of its impact, obviously, on things like employment in the future, and mm -hmm. um, uh, obviously uh, productivity and involvement in the community. Um, and because of that, we're we're seeing more young people going to hospital, mm -hmm. uh, presenting acutely as far as suicide and substance use related incidents. And um, that's really created a lot of uh, a lot of concerns, raised a lot of questions, and, and fueled a week like Mental Health Mental Health Awareness Week. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, talking about suicide, I think um, in 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 Canada, the media does not cover suicide, and therefore a lot of the cases and a lot of the situations where suicide has been committed in in our communities or any communities does not surface to to outside. But we are seeing that a number of young people in the past many years 
have committed uh, suicide uh, in all communities, including Tamil community as well, right? Is that is that a pressing issue within uh, within Canada? Oh, it's it's a it's definitely a pressing issue within Canada. There was actually a McLean's article that came out a, a couple years ago, uh, highlighting um, Kashechuan, a First Nations community mm -hmm. in northern Ontario, as being the suicide capital of the world per capita, mm -hmm. and most of that suicide is is fueled by youth. Uh, and we have examples of that in our own community. Yeah. I was just at a mental health event uh, yesterday in Mississauga yeah. uh, at Heart with Heartland Credit View, yeah. and it highlighted uh, one of our own youth who, mm -hmm. who passed away yeah. uh, by virtue of the same thing. Mm -hmm. um, it's clearly something that's uh, not only getting more attention, but in some really unfortunate cases being glorified mm -hmm. uh, through through media, through mm -hmm. social media. Mm -hmm. So it uh, it exacerbates the issue. It complicates things even more. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, uh, no, it's 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 a, it's a very complex there's a lot of victim blaming there's also a lot of you know glorification so many other different layers right and, uh, and and it's hard to position and to have a meaningful conversation around some of these because it's very sensitive to all parties concerned right um, you work uh, with uh, young people who have uh, faced uh, you know some sort of an encounter with criminal justice system but also with newcomer youth as well right and newcomer families Absolutely. so what are your experiences in terms of issues uh, that you're seeing you know, I think um, the biggest issue is the lack of resources that, that, that exists. Um, and when we're talking about you know, newcomer populations, the inability to navigate a very complex mental health system to get the, the necessary supports, it's very challenging to do so. Um, a lot of times we have um, issues where um, individuals who aren't appropriately trained um, to, to diagnose and support individuals, young people with mental health issues, are making diagnoses. I mean, mm -hmm. there's this term that we all hear about overdiagnosis. It's in the newspaper all the time. Well, by virtue of nature, that can't exist. If an individual has a diagnosis of a mental health disorder, and they're diagnosed, then they're appropriately diagnosed. There is a significant amount of misdiagnosis, mm -hmm. right, of individuals yeah. who, you know, ADHD, for example, is something um, that that is that is diagnosed by school teachers, principals, soccer coaches, um, all of this, and and as newcomers who aren't really familiar with how to navigate systems, um, if the teacher says that your son or your daughter has X problem, you go to the doctor and say, "Can I have medicine to fix this?" Mm -hmm. And that's actually happened mm -hmm. um, in 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 my practice where I've contacted the school and said, "Well, you know, was there a psychiatrist or?" or a psychologist who came in to do an assessment, well, no, but we know based on the child's behavior. Mm -hmm. And these parents were ready to medicate their child. Mm -hmm. and, and maybe that would have been the, the appropriate treatment process, but it needs to be assessed appropriately as well. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, so, I mean, the, there is layers to this, right? Mm -hmm. One is obviously the newcomer and the immigration challenges, mm -hmm. right? But also, uh, we know that newcomer population is overrepresented in poverty. In terms of uh, access to income, right? Mm -hmm. So, how does all this intersectionality, whether it's income or n immigration status, race, and gender, and those things play? Well, so social determinants of health impact. There, yeah. there, there are social determinants of mental health as well. Um, we have increased situations, uh, increased amounts of stress. Um, we have, you know, this term parentification that occurs, where you have young young people taking on roles that maybe in, 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 this, in, in our current society that, that aren't considered to be appropriate for a young child. Mm -hmm. But um, you know, in South Asian communities, it's not that abnormal for an elder child to look after younger children. Mm -hmm. um, there, there's a lack of parents um, observing what their children are doing. Mm -hmm. uh, th there's, there's, there's many factors um, that, that aren't unique mm -hmm. um, to newcomers necessarily, because we have we have populations that that live under uh, under horrendous poverty. I mean, if we look at Aboriginal mm -hmm. communities, I mean, a lot of those those factors are the same. But the added challenge of the language issue is significant, mm -hmm. um, because we there 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 is a, a, a shortage of individuals that that have the linguistic skills to support our communities. Mm -hmm. Um, and there's translation services. I mean, every hospital has a translation mm -hmm. service, mm -hmm. but that in itself is challenging. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah like speaking that. of languages, I mean, um, in, in, in Tamil, within our community, I could say, um, the parents not being able to communicate with the mm -hmm. children, right? Mm -hmm. they, they don't know how to communicate. The children don't know how to communicate back to their parents. Mm -hmm. I heard um, young kids, I mean, kids going to university telling me, 
I don't know, my, my parents don't know what I'm doing at all. You know, I try to explain them, but they don't know what I'm doing. So there's sometimes there's a risk of isolation, and some kids are lucky that probably they have, they find a social support um, mm -hmm. that's more pro appropriate and positive. And um, some, some kids don't have that social mm -hmm. uh, support system. Um, so the language between the, the different generations, it's an issue. Mm -hmm. Financial constraint, it's huge, especially uh, a, a new community such as mm -hmm. Tamil community. Um, you know, parents have to, uh, d many jobs, um, so financial constraints create uh, uh, problems within the parents, mm -hmm. um, and that creates, again, neglect, that creates that not being able to provide the secure attachment. Um, yeah. That's huge. But you also don't have money to spend on recreation and other healthy related stuff to stay mm -hmm. emotionally healthy as well, right? Absolutely. Because physical health and emotional health are tied in yeah. together, Absolutely. and if you're not spending on entertainment or recreation or you know, well-being, uh, yeah. you know, there is a bit of a, everything costs. Everything, yeah. And the other thing is, the other challenge is, um, you know, for the newcomers, uh, the, the sort of understanding of mental health. Mm -hmm. So right. you, you initiated this Manadaluru Di uh project, uh, and, and it's creating awareness mm -hmm. within Tamil community, right? Mm -hmm. What are some challenges you're facing? Is it, is, it, is it reaching into the pockets that we need to reach? Is it a progress or is it... <laughs> A, yeah. a long Not journey. the entire <laughs> show, but you can have a few minutes to talk about it. <laughs> I know, I know. I know. <laughs> you could take the entire show <laughs> yeah. if you want to. <laughs> um, no, it's a long journey, and we only started last year. It was yeah. very difficult. Um, what we find is, uh, again, mental health, People, it's not their priority, mm -hmm. especially for newcomers community, because they have other things they need to provide for their families and other things on their mind. It's not the yeah. priority. And they also don't understand mental health versus mental illness. Mm -hmm. As soon as mental health comes, they think that the extreme level of mental illness is, you know, psych being Very psychotic, true. that's mm -hmm. the problem. That's yeah. what they think. Um, so they don't, and also for us, Tamils, we experience a lot of struggles back home. So we, we are resilient people, mm -hmm. but we don't understand that the challenges that we are facing here and younger people, that face the challenges they are facing here are different from we faced in Sri Lanka, mm -hmm. and also the resources. We expect are the same resilience of people exactly, who are in the next exactly. four, former generation exactly. to be in the younger generation who grow up here, which is not the case, right? So yes. And that same cultural expectation leads to less people accessing the sort of sustainable services mm -hmm. that they need, uh, and because of that, you're seeing lots of people showing up to the emergency. You're seeing a lot of people requiring hospitalization for mm -hmm. attempted suicide, drug overdose. Mm -hmm. But you're not seeing in those same neighborhoods, whether that's Aboriginal communities or low-income neighborhoods, that intersectionality with race and income, mm -hmm. uh, you're not seeing them access outpatient mental health services. Mm -hmm. So they're not getting that sort of that's stable treatment, um, but you're unfortunately still seeing them in life-threatening situations and going to the hospital in huge numbers. So the, the, let's talk a bit because you do a lot of work with addiction, right? Yes. And um, addiction is not completely understood, not just in our community, generally, as, yeah. the, me as the framing of mental health. Sure. Right? And, and, you know, and, and also uh, the, the support that's needed for addiction uh, often is not provided from a mental health angle. It's almost like you can stop it if you want to stop it type thing, right? Mm -hmm. Now, harm reduction is often like something that's hard to sell in some of the communities, right? And, and some of the families even, like when, when yeah. I see parents who are not completely open to any of those concepts, right? So uh, how do you explain to community members uh, about the connection between the two? Yeah, no, you know, even within mental health, uh, amongst professionals, yeah. um, there isn't a strong understanding of addiction. Mm -hmm. uh, the way perhaps it ought to be. Mm -hmm. uh, and then when you take that and you bring it out into the community, that misunderstanding is multiplied. Mm -hmm. And then you take on the stigma within mental health. Mm -hmm. uh, and then on top of that, you try and look at that in the context of youth. Youth who are dealing with a lot of judgment, a lot of miseducation or lack of education. And then this notion that addictions is uh, really a situation where a person is making uh, some strong moral decisions against their own welfare. Mm -hmm. uh, when in fact, addiction is a medical condition. Mm -hmm. right? We have research now to show that your brain changes uh, in ways that make you more vulnerable to addiction, mm -hmm. and your brain changes after you've been taking a substance. Mm -hmm. uh, and getting that education out there, when people are still reinventing the wheel around what mm -hmm. mental health is, Right, um, we, we had a great, uh, you know, Jawad brought up a really important point around that, uh, uh, you know, over, over education and uh, in some cases, uh, parents really sort of defining exactly what treatment should be when maybe they need a bit more education themselves. Mm -hmm. uh, we're at an intersectionality where mental health is still being 
discovered. Mm -hmm. And so because of that, a lot of different people with uh, varying levels of experience are defining what ADHD is, mm -hmm. what depression is, what mental illness versus uh, you know, uh, a disorder or a challenge mm -hmm. is. And in addictions, that, that's multiplied. So what we really, really focus on is taking the judgment out of addictions, mm -hmm. talking about what it is, which is a medical condition, mm -hmm. and really focusing around what we can do mm -hmm. after that so that Tis parents and children, yeah. adolescents, young adults, yeah. Um, Not just hope. as practitioners, but people living with people who have addiction. What is what are some techniques they should be using? What are some ways to kind of that is the other bigger challenge, right? You know, because it's hard for people to deal, uh, and that's what I mean. We talk about people who are impacted by mental health directly, but the indirect impact on families is, is huge. And it's huge. Uh, you know, the 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 overrunning theme when it comes to addiction is safety. Although mm -hmm. you could really apply that to mental health generally, yeah. and safety for the client, in this case, youth or adolescents, mm -hmm. but also safety for the surrounding family. Mm -hmm. And uh, being able to bring people together in a way that uh, they all feel safe does involve the very thing that a lot of immigrant communities ha and newcomer communities and segregated communities have difficult with, difficulty with, which is accessing services. Mm -hmm. right? Services are often seen as barriers for good reason, mm -hmm. but there's an opportunity where they can actually be a kind of mediator. Mm -hmm. So you're, you're, you're a parent as well, if I may say on the show. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> uh, absolutely. You know, uh, the, 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 there is, you know, I, 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 was at a, I used to work at a community center where they had programs called kids have stress too, mm -hmm. right? For under five-year-old kids teaching parents how to help under five-year-old to deal with stress. And the parents had difficulty understanding that, right? And, and sometimes, you know, our young people grow up saying, I'm stressed, I'm stressed, I'm stressed. And parents tend to think, you know, this is an overused term uh, mm -hmm. and uh, underappreciate the kind of reasoning behind it, right? Mm -hmm. So how do parents deal with uh, understanding young people's expectations? Because it's hard for, after we grow old, it's hard to contextualize what the struggles could be in a new generation, right? Well, yeah, and, you know, I mean, I hear myself saying things that my father said to me, <laughs> to my children, and I, you know, and I had promised myself as a young person never to do that. But I think uh, the one thing that parents can do is help their children develop resilience. Um, there are, you know, if, if you look at public schools today, in the morning and after school, there's nobody walking to school. Mm -hmm. Everybody gets a ride, mm -hmm. um, and everyone has their cell phone, so they have to wait till they get the call or the text message. And mm -hmm. um, children aren't given the opportunity to develop independence mm -hmm. um, and to develop, develop coping skills. Mm -hmm. um, at the same time, particularly with newcomer communities where there's added stress on on young people because they're the ones who have to go with their parents to their medical appointments to mm -hmm. explain. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I had a young person um, come to me, and he was he was so s he was so genuinely stressed out because his father was going to have to go for a prostate exam, and he had to be there to explain what was mm -hmm. going to happen, and it was just mortifying for him yeah. to have to be th there for that process. So um, we have these added stressors on on these 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 young people, um, and you know, there's times where parents step in too often mm -hmm. um, to save the day. And, and, and they don't allow young people to develop resilience. Mm -hmm. At the same time, we need to accept that um, we need to seek out supports. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, parenting groups are, are fantastic options, mm -hmm. but unless you utilize the resources that exist, they're not, they're not helpful to you at all. Mm -hmm. And they need to be provided in a, in a manner that is, is palatable for a community. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it, they, it needs to be understood that you know, um, for example, in a Muslim community, to offer a program on Friday at one o'clock is not a good idea because everyone's going to be at the mosque. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Or, you know, what maybe offering services close to the temple yeah. where where parents and families will be, okay. right? But those things aren't happening. Yeah, most services and more community spaces close with nine to five. And exactly, just, and know, that doesn't work for families. Uh, yeah, especially families that have difficult schedules. Mm -hmm. uh, Indeed. Stuff, right? Yeah. So. Um, in, in Tamil community, because that's what I'm most familiar with, but it's generally in other communities too, yeah. there is a lot of name calling around mental health related terms, right? You know, it's, it's almost like, you know, either pick an animal and use the animal's name to swear at somebody, mm -hmm. or you use a particular mental health state, right? Sure, and yeah. it, it, that, that's not just, I mean, I, I'm familiar with Hindi, this does the same yeah. thing, Urdu, mm -hmm. and I'm sure, you know, in English as well, because I didn't grow up in an English surrounding, I wouldn't, I wouldn't know. But how does that sensitivity, uh, how, do we have to be 
sensitive or is it just something natural we should let uh, let that deal with right uh, well yeah we need to be uh, I mean that's needs the education piece yeah. uh, public education it's it's, it's very crucial um, what it is that when we look at mental illness it is not it doesn't define the person as a whole person yeah. it's an aspect of that person yeah. you have strengths you have weaknesses you know and illness it's, it's a part of you mm -hmm. right so that the understanding has to come but unfortunately because like he said you know our, our thinking that sort of we, we carry that generation to generation right so we need to break it at some point mm -hmm. through this public education so that I won't be passing on that kind of a thinking to my kids and the kids mm -hmm. won't be passing that kind of a thinking to generations mm -hmm. to come. Because yeah. those names are often used as a label to the entire person exactly. rather than exactly. the behavior of it, right? Exactly. And, and once those terms are being used in derogatory ways, somebody who identifies with a particular condition that resonates with that particular name, they're not going to come out and say it, right? So exactly. And then that, that creates your, you know, brings your self-esteem down and brings like, oh, I'm not used for anything, you know, I'm not going to achieve in anything, yeah. I can't move forward, I can't try that, right? It yeah. really I think especially down. for young people. I mean, mm -hmm. we tend to think young people laugh it out, but they in surroundings laugh it out, but internally many of them are dealing with that. So um, I want to come to you before uh, we break for a half segment uh, because we're going to be seeing Dr. Josephine Wang as mm -hmm. well this time. Um, you work with uh, youth who have faced, uh, you know, criminal justice system in some ways. Mm -hmm. um, and, and the justice system and the criminal justice system is not a fair system in any, any terms. It's, you know, it's, there are biases that we're seeing and that continues to be seen. Mm -hmm. um, so what kind of impact do you see with, what's the intersection, what's the kind of relationship between the two? Because sometimes people who have a mental health need may be ending up in it, or sometimes having gone through that process may lead to further stress, right? So a chicken and egg kind of thing, right? Well, you, 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 you hit it right on the head there um, when you said that um, people with a mental health need sometimes end up incarcerated. Yeah. Uh, we know um, there was research done by um, Lionel Penrose, and, and he looked at the, um, there, there was an inverse relationship between number of uh, mental health spaces and beds available and number of individuals incarcerated. And very closely you could see the pattern. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Hospital spaces closed, incarcerations increased, and vice versa. Mm -hmm. So we know that individuals with mental health who with mental health challenges who aren't getting treatment, they need to go somewhere, and they need to get help somewhere. And unfortunately, incarceration is if os is often the place they end up. Mm -hmm. um, jails are not hospitals; they're not designed to assess and treat. They're 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 there to manage, mm -hmm. and and. In, in fairness to the, the correctional institutions, that's what they're able to do. Yeah, that's um, what they're resourced to do. Anyway. Yeah, exactly. Um, so we know that there's that relationship. Um, the, the other thing, though, is that um, you need to look at the, 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 the grief that these individuals go through, mm -hmm. um, because it is a grieving process. Mm -hmm. um, you know, when an individual is psychotic and they assault someone, for example, maybe a family member, their mother, sister, whatnot, um, they don't forget that mm -hmm. when they're stable. So, so there's, there's that challenge that they're living with. Um, and then there's, then there's the mental health piece. When you're looking at newcomer populations, um, w there's, there's, there's a natural process by which we, we try to bubble ourselves in and protect ourselves and stay away from the broader community. Um, but the challenges that exist within the broader community will impact our, our communities as well. Yeah. Um, you know, when I go into a detention center, um, the population of the detention center is just like the population at the mall. It looks the same. Mm -hmm. um, and there is such shame and stigma around um, incarceration, even if it is related to a mental health challenge, that families almost want to, when that individual is released, almost want to just keep them at home. Mm -hmm you know, stay quiet, um, I don't want to show my face. Mm -hmm. there's, there's, there's so many layers of stigma that exist. Mm -hmm. um, and when we talk about l language, there, there's a significant amount of under-resourcing mm -hmm. with just correctional officers mm -hmm. who speak different languages. Yeah. Um, what, what often happens is an inmate will translate for another inmate mm -hmm. um, because that's, that's where the resources exist. Mm -hmm. 
It's a very complex situation, and I think it's something that we need to spend more time Indeed. as a, as communities to understand mm -hmm. better. And I mean, it's, it's a, the intersectionality is often not understood. And in fact, uh, many people, uh, you know, tend to uh, look at these situations as I isolated or like segmented or, mm -hmm. or in silos rather than in in the connection. So, thank you, Jawad. Uh, Jawad Bhatti is a social worker. He's here. Uh, to share his views and thanks for your time uh, for ex taking us through some of the experiences and uh, some of the some of the knowledge that you've gained. That was my pleasure. So, so we're going to take a quick break. When we come back, we're going to talk a bit more about stigma and also talk a bit more about systemic issues like lack of research, lack of services and so on uh, further. So stay tuned. After a few minutes of commercial break, we will be back. Welcome back. You're watching Crossroads with Neet and Shan. We're marking Mental Health Awareness Week with a topic of mental health and young adults. Uh, this is the second part of the segment of the show, and uh, we're joined with Dr. Josephine Wang. Uh, Dr. Wang is a professor at Ryerson University with School of Nursing. You're also the principal investigator uh, with a project looking into stigma in Asian and South Asian men called um, Strength and Unity? Yes. Okay. So why don't you tell us uh, a bit about the, the kind of... Uh, the sure. reason why a uh, focus on men and mm -hmm. stigma. Yes, a lot of people ask us, you know, why only men? So this is a special research project that is in Toronto, Calgary, and Vancouver. And I'm <coughs> co-leading it with Dr. Kenneth Feng in Toronto. Mm -hmm. And the reason why we focus on men is that um, in Asian communities in general, very few people want to talk about mental health in a positive way. And it's even harder for men because men face ex, you know, additional challenges. Um, I think across many communities, men tend to shy away from talking about their feelings and emotions. And mental health is such, um, in some way elusive in the sense that people want to see symptoms. Mm -hmm. So if you had a swollen face, you had sore joints, you're bleeding, people say, well, there's something wrong with you. Mm -hmm. But then when it's mental health issue, it's a lot harder for people to actually think about it and talk about it. And for men, because a lot of times, especially Asian men in South Asian communities, East Asian, Southeast Asian communities, their expectation for them to be strong, mm -hmm. they are supposed to lead the family, so that makes it even harder. And on the other hand, women are expected to be the caregiver, so if anybody is ill in the family, it's the women who take them to the, mm -hmm. the doctors. Mm -hmm. So what, what does that actually leave men? Mm -hmm. to uh, address their mental health challenges. So this is a three-year project, and we are very excited about it because it's not just a research. You do the research and you put it on the shelf in the library. We, it's actually an intervention study mm -hmm. because we know that there are lots of stigma, but then what do we do about it? So this study would actually do something, do training so that it reduce the stigma so that mm -hmm. men in the community mm -hmm. will work with women work with others to actually become ambassadors. Mm -hmm. So you already started the project and yes. rolling. So how is the response from the community? And, and what are some of the challenges as well? Right. Because it's important to identify. So some of the challenges, um, actually we have already completed two waves. Mm -hmm. So in each wave, we aim at getting about 53 men mm -hmm. to participate in four arms of the study. So they would go into one part is acceptance and commitment training, mm -hmm. which looked at the cycle flexibility. How do we work with men so that they become flexible, so that they recognize that there might be challenges, but I have certain values and I can take commit to action to mm -hmm. do something about it. Then there is the contact-based uh, empowerment education that support men to actually collectively work together to go out and advocate for issues. Then we have one group that actually would take part in both intervention. Then we have one group that would come to uh, the common didactic, you know, one session mm -hmm. type of uh, mental health 101. Mm -hmm. And so far, we have worked with young people, and I was actually truly very touched and energized by them because they are very passionate about doing something. The mm -hmm. young men themselves said that, yes, this is a topic that, you know, my parents don't want to talk about, my mm -hmm. relatives don't want to talk about. We really should do something about this. Mm -hmm. So it's mm -hmm. actually been great. Yeah. 
Um, so let's uh, switch gears into stakeholders. Um, you know, we talked about researchers and the role the research has to play. We'll talk a bit more later as well. But family physicians, I mean, um, we only go to family physicians in many families when there's something wrong, which is also an issue. But at least we go to family physicians, right? <laughs> Occasionally, <laughs> uh, we go to family physicians. And, uh, and there are a number of them who are Tamil. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's, it's a good thing because, you know, you can have a linguistically and culturally sensitive approach, right? Uh, what role can they play? Are they playing or is it improving? Because I know there are places where they haven't been able to play an active role in, in you know, in guiding, uh, you know, community members in accessing mental health support. Well, you know, in the benefits of, of family physicians, um, uh, especially in the Tamil community, are that they're a traditional point of contact. Yeah. There's actually lots of different types of primary care providers uh, in our in our society today. But uh, especially with uh, you know any any immigrant community, any community that functions traditionally, and and we're probably in in, in the middle of that of that change mm -hmm. uh, in terms of in terms of the Tamil community, uh, family physicians are still identified as a point of contact. Uh, it normalizes the encounter. Uh, and it probably normalizes the discussion about mental health uh, on, a, on a broader uh, sort of stage. Um, physicians generally are still learning about mental health. You know, the, the whole symptomatology uh, piece is, is one that I think uh, still vexes a lot of uh, medical professionals and physicians are among them. Uh -huh. um, so that is a transition not just for Tamil physicians, for, for many physicians. Um, and so. You know, uh, both educating the community, <laughs> but on a different stream, educating uh, physicians, uh, understanding their role as very important stakeholders, especially in our community, uh, is is paramount. Mm -hmm. And uh, the yeah, the the more sensitive, uh, the more able, mm -hmm. uh, and the more connected uh, a physician is, um, as far as mental health services, mm -hmm. uh, the better the you know the course of treatment, and and I, I suppose without getting too dramatic, the prognosis mm -hmm. is for someone. Yeah. Yeah, just want to add to that. Um, he's right. I mean, for traditionally, family physicians are the primary contact for us. Um, there was a research done about a five years ago uh, focusing on Tamil community, Sri Lankan Tamil community. It was done by Kamach and, and other collaboration of other researchers. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the findings said that um, we are trained culturally to open up more to our primary care for, for doctors. So we, when we go there for physical concerns, we also talk about uh, fa relationship issues, financial issues. Maybe a bit too much. <laughs> <sometimes>. <laughs> too much, but, but it, it opens up. At least yes, that's a good thing. Good. At mean, least I, a good I thing. I was just joking <laughs> about it. it, it <laughs> more is better. Exactly. Yeah. It, it just opens up. Yeah. But what, what I also, I mean, in my work, I mean, this is a job that I do where I advocate for my clients because they can't speak for themselves, so I need to go with them um, to the family physicians. What I see is, uh, yes, they are learning, uh, but for, especially for Tamil people, counseling, any kind of therapy, it's very foreign to us. Mm -hmm. So I would probably want to see more of family doctors uh, sort of uh, uh, making those referrals or uh, encouraging them to uh, to go to these supports, like specific supports outside of the, the medical model. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. That and also making referrals to maybe uh, uh, psychiatrists if needed, if there is a consultation needed, uh, because a lot of people don't know that mm -hmm. uh, they, you know, family doctors can refer them mm -hmm. to psychiatrists. So, uh, being more proactive a little bit more mm -hmm. that would be helpful. Okay. In the community. So we talked a lot about things that the community can do. So I'm just going to spend the rest of the maybe you know we have about uh, you know, 10, 12 minutes left. Talk a bit more about systems. So we talked about physicians. Let's talk a bit about research. Um, you know, many of the research I see is very Eurocentric, mm -hmm. talking about mental health. I mean, mental health is one of the least research within the health sector, mm -hmm. and even within that, there's a lot of Eurocentric things, right? But your research, for example, is, is good that it's looking at a specific population in a more, you know, more detailed way. But how do we access data? Like, do you think there needs to be a lot more data collection, race-based data collection, uh, you know, mm -hmm. various intersectionality-based data collection to understand the issues better? or even advocate for support, because if you don't quantify what the needs are, it's hard to request support, right? Right. So this is really tying to what you were all saying about um, you know, alternatives, right? So family doctor is a great resource. So the research that we're doing is different from the traditional research, because I personally am sick and tired of seeing newcomer mental health research. The rate of depression is more amongst newcomer women than men but they are just 
not really relevant, right? Because it's really, we don't ask the community, what is it that you need, right? So our research is strength in unity. It's different, it's a community-based action research. So um, we talk to men who come through, uh, through focus group and actually ask them, what is happening in the community? How do people in your community actually define mental health? And what are some of the challenges and what are the stigma? So finding out qualitatively mm -hmm. what are the challenges and what will support them mm -hmm. to actually overcome some of these stigma and take action. Then we also use uh, some of the valid data scale mm -hmm. so that we can measure after they come through the training, is there actually reduction in their mental illness stigma? Are they more ready to actually engage in the communities? And what is really important is that throughout the research, we engage the participant every three months, mm -hmm. bring them together so that they can share what they have been doing mm -hmm. in the community to, to encourage each other what is happening. The other part that we are doing is also mobilizing the community so that it's not just research. We want to be such that at the end, and before the project is over, there'll be commu community coalition building mm -hmm. so that the community actually could get together and, and take action, look for resources, will support community to identify how to use the research result to mm -hmm. actually look for resources to develop program that is relevant mm -hmm. to them. Mm -hmm. And this time engaging, you know, intergenerational men, families and, and women. Mm -hmm. And but the first part is actually to engage men so they take on that lead role mm -hmm. to become ambassador. And I think that we're taking an empowerment approach mm -hmm. and that is actually really important. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, uh, Toronto District School Board, for example, collected data based on race and was able to find that, you know, South Asian students had, you know, despite in some circles, higher performance academically had a lower self-confidence or, you know, self-esteem related stuff. There were other data that we've found from health about diabetes and heart and stroke re prevalence among you know, South Asians and so on, right? Do you advocate for more specific data with respect to mental health, uh, with respect to South Asians and, or Tamils? Well, or, oh, absolutely, yeah. right? Uh, and, and in an ideal world, we'd be able to go about doing that. Some of the challenges with that are uh, collecting data of any kind is sensitive. Mm -hmm. uh, the stigma that comes with mental health only increases that sensitivity. Yeah. I really love the idea that Josephine is propagating through uh, strength and unity uh, with the notion of coalition building, mm -hmm. because it really speaks to what Jawad was uh, discussing as far as developing resilience in the individual. Mm -hmm. Now you're developing resilience in the community. And if you can do that, uh, it makes it a lot safer. Mm -hmm. And things like data collection uh, become a little bit less sensitive mm -hmm. uh, and maybe more specific so that we can start to find out exactly what needs to be done. But on the, on the flip side, for example, if somebody calls me, I used to be a youth worker, I used to be in the community services and stuff like that. If some parent calls me or youth calls me for support, it's hard to find a culturally, linguistically service, uh, service provider, a sensitive service provider to refer. And sometimes they are being thrown from one place to another, you know, by the time they come back, they've already gone to five, six different mm. people. Uh, and and so, so that's not the best model for us to look at, right? So sometimes to advocate for ethnospecificity or even gender specific uh, support or religiously sensitive support and stuff like that, uh, the data is often, the, or research and data is often the most important public policy pusher, right? Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and there's a bit of a reluctance around, you know, stigma is often the reason cited. Um, how do we navigate that and, and, and advocate for services? Well, I mean, ul ultimately, I think it starts with, and maybe Joseph, you can speak to this a bit more, just as far as being able to get that type of money behind Asian-based researching, yeah. if that's the best way to sort of yeah. term it. But ultimately, it, it does start with, uh, you know, people developing an initiative, and it does maybe begin with that type of advocacy that isn't always data-driven. Yeah. Yeah. So you can get ad so that you can advocate for yeah. something that's a lot more data data specific. Mm -hmm. yeah. Talking about advocacy, mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, our, our community uh, organization, we have a number of organizations, organizations now in our yeah. community. I think the, the alphabetic soups, <laughs> you know, they're C and a T, Canadian and Tamil, but everything else, uh, uh, different letters get <laughs> yeah. rearranged, right? So we have a number of organizations and we've done a, quite a good job in some advocacy when mm -hmm. it comes to foreign policy related stuff. Mm -hmm. You know, we're not the best, but we have at least done some work on that. Mm -hmm. So is there a role for community organizations to play in advocacy for support? Absolutely. And are they, are they up for it? Absolutely. Well, I, I like the <coughs> idea you said, the resiliency, building resilience in the collaboration. And one of the Man of the Lord, the Let's Talk um, um, Healthy Minds campaign that we started, 
that's what it focuses on. We realize that because, as you said, so many organizations, they operate in silos. So we don't know where the, the, the gaps in services. So we don't need to reinvent the wheel again, but we need to bring people together and create that collaboration so we could have more conversation and we could identify these gaps. And the other thing is, like you said, you know, people who are suffering with mental illnesses, and if we want them to come out and seek help, we're, it's, it's wishful thinking. Oh, two in three are suffering silence. Mm -hmm. So we need allies. We need stronger mm -hmm. voices, such as friends and families and the, you know, your little com community members, to be these allies so that we could reach out to this population that needs help. Mm -hmm. um, so definitely, I mean, there is hope uh, with this uh, campaign. Uh, rather than last year, this year we're hearing more interest mm -hmm. from different organizations mm -hmm. and also organizations operate within their mandates. So mm -hmm. one organization to be able to take on this huge challenge with mm -hmm. so many layers of complexity, mm -hmm. they're going to burn out. Mm -hmm. So we need all these hands to come together and even um, businesses mm -hmm. because some of these initiatives do need uh, financial, financial support, support. Mm -hmm. and sustainability d definitely requires financial support. So both support. ways, one, these organizations doing awareness in the community, but these organizations can they collectively advocate for government policy change or funding resources. Right? Yes, and, and speaking of that, so Tamil Health Association, they're already part of, uh, it's, it's a research-based community organization, already part of the mm -hmm. Men uh, Stigma Project. Mm -hmm. And they are going to be taking um, another, doing another project based on, uh, on youth mental health. Mm -hmm. They will be scanning the services available in uh, Tamil community right now mm -hmm. and, and provide a sort of a clear picture of what's missing in terms mm -hmm. of services. Yeah. So that's, uh, it's underway. So uh, I mean that data can be, we could advocate more and say, look, here are the needs, and we need more people, we need more resources to tackle mm -hmm. the problems. Mm -hmm. right? mm -hmm. And I think another part that is, uh, I think ethno-specific research is very important, as you pointed out, but we need to find ways so that we define how that research is done. Mm -hmm. Because if we actually frame the research to show that is really the structural determinants, like what you were saying before about poverty, mm -hmm. about stress from a violent neighborhood, and people are there because they are living in poverty, mm -hmm. the kind of racism our young people are facing, mm -hmm. and then the conflict they have because they internalize some of this oppression and racism, mm -hmm. and they had conflict with their grandparents and parents at home. We need to define those research ourselves so that we bring out these other issues rather than having a lot of those data just say that mm -hmm. Tamil youth are this, mm -hmm. Tamil youth are this, because those are reinforcing the racism that is happening. So I think research is very important, but we need to define the research ourselves. Mm -hmm. yeah. And yeah, so it's, uh, it's important that you're not mm -hmm. tokenized or used yes. in research. Yes. And that's the other other problem. Uh, many of the low-income neighborhoods would complain that they are tired of people mm -hmm. coming and asking them yeah. one after the other with a set of questions to mm -hmm. do research. Mm -hmm. And in, in, in many f situations, not even going back to report back what the mm -hmm. findings are, right? So, yeah. so it's important to be sensitive around that. So we are coming to the last part of the thing. So I'm just going to get, uh, maybe I'll start with uh, Dr. Wang to come this way, right? So we talked a lot, but I think one key thing we were talking about is stigma. We mm -hmm. talked about in many ways, right? Mm -hmm. So what are some concrete steps in, in very, like a minute <laughs> <laughs> summary version, what are some concrete steps to uh, eliminate stigma? Because that's an important key step towards uh, you know, dealing with mental health. So in our project, the uh, acceptance commitment training actually will support people to become mindful and have that awareness that many of the rules that we're living in so that if young children are growing up saying that you're not good enough, you don't look good enough, you do, you're not tall like me, we actually train people to recognize that it's a thought. Mm -hmm. And then from there to explore their values and because I really care about my community, I really care about my family, I am willing to take risks to speak out mm -hmm. against stigma. And I think that when we talk to community members, adults and youth in this project so far, and people, the one thing that came out really strong for everybody is family. Mm -hmm. So I think we can tap into that value of our family to support each other. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, it, uh, it, it's, it's definitely a, a stepwise piece, but uh, for, I think for a lot of people, understanding and uh, really when they start to pay attention to this problem is when things become emergent, when there is an event, an incident, something acute, and uh, a bit of education around uh, identifying um, when someone needs help, uh, and then sort of working your way back and identifying maybe a bit earlier when people uh, can use other services uh, and how to be somebody who's helpful. 
And that is both a, a community piece, but it's also an individual piece. It revolves around education. And uh, you know, great work that the Tamil Health Association is doing as far as identifying the landscape, letting people know once you do identify that, where it is that you can go. Uh, whether that's your traditional point of contact or your non-traditional point of contact. Uh, and more importantly, that all those stakeholders know who they need to send people to. Uh, that takes a lot of time, uh, but it's, uh, it's essential. Because uh, you know the, the point that Josephine made around structural determinants, uh, the challenges that ethnic communities are, are facing aren't new mm -hmm. uh, it, with regard to what's being seen in Canada. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and the notion of newcomer, right, it's, it's in some ways a derogatory term because, mm -hmm. well, first of all, communities have been here for a very long time. Mm -hmm. And secondly, it makes it seem as if it's a newcomer problem. Rather but in reality, things like yeah. low income and, low and income. lack of infrastructure and uh, you know the, the remnants of incarceration and addiction, those are those have been around for for many 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 generations, mm -hmm. and we're just encountering it now because of circumstances. So, so education and and, and acute identification are important. Mm -hmm. okay. um, I'm kind of repeat what they said. <laughs> what is the equation? You know, when you look at these uh, mental health issues or concerns, youth is just one part of the equation. So, incorporating families, mm -hmm. you have to integrate both. Uh, you know, in in terms of uh, uh, combating stigma, uh, because a lot of the things that kids pick up while they are growing up and the value system that they're you know, picking up from their parents, it's so crucial in terms of how they're going to uh, mm -hmm. behave when they come into yeah. adulthood. Um, the other thing is, other piece is uh, public education on um, not just mental illness, but also on mental health. And, mm -hmm. and you know, taking care of your mental well-being, emotional be well-being, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, for, for us, it's, it's, we don't talk about it. And also, we don't ask help for help. Mm -hmm. we, we think that it's okay, you know, we need to, we don't even want to go to the doctors, and mm -hmm. we say it very proudly, you know, I don't go to the doctor. Mm -hmm. So, it's okay to ask help. Mm -hmm. Getting that call, change that culture. Mm -hmm. And that comes, need to, like a lot of public education that needs to mm -hmm. change that. Thank Great. you. Thank you very much for your time. This has been very useful getting into understanding mental health and mm -hmm. as it relates to young people uh, to mark this Mental Health Awareness Week. Uh, there's more discussion to be had uh, on Crossroads on this. We'll follow up with more detail on many topics that we couldn't go deeper on because of time constraints. So Sudarshi Ignatius, uh, Dr. Jonathan Bertram, Dr. Josephine Wong, thank you very much for taking the time and coming to the studio to share your insights and experiences with us. So thank you viewers for watching Crossroads with Nathan Shan. We talked about mental health needs, particularly among young adults from various dimensions. Uh, but as Sudarshi mentioned, you know, young adults are not in isolation. When we're talking about mental health, this is a complete package of the society, of the neighborhood, the community, the family they live in, the schools they go to, the employment places they are working in, and so on. So uh, with that understanding, we hope uh, we can all work to, uh, together to eliminate stigma and provide better services for our young people. Thank you for watching Crossroads with Neetan Shan. Uh, please uh, send your comments to crossroads at tamilvision.tv, and we'll see you next week with another topic. Thank you.